It's a great pleasure to welcome the keynote speaker of today, Stefan Hütfors, who is going to present co-creating value and future business trends. And as we discussed a little bit earlier, how to introduce Stefan, and the easiest way we said was to call you a futurist. Yes. Warm does welcome. It, does that make sense? I don't know. Maybe some of you have toast this morning. Did you think about how many parts there is in a toaster? No, I guess not. There is 404 parts in a regular toaster. And the reason I know that is because I read the story about a guy called Thomas Twaits. Thomas, he um, sort of challenged him, himself because he, he thought, what if I was alone? What if I didn't have anyone to collaborate with, to co-create anything with? So he set up for an experiment. Let's try to make a regular thing like a toaster all by myself. So then, obviously, he, he went to just a, you know, um, appliance store and he bought a toaster and he disassembled it and he found out there are 404 parts. And then he started to try to figure out how to make these 404 parts. So, so he needed iron, for instance. So he called a mining company and asked for permission to come and dig for ore. So that's how this event started, you know. We will jump to the toaster. I will show the, you. This is one year later and 1,600 euros in costs. This is the creation of Thomas Twaits. He claims that he was bold enough to plug this into a socket and uh, try if, and uh, manage to toast a sandwich in it. I, you can see it looks kind of ugly. That's because, he says, that's because when he was at the point where he was going to make a plastic cover for the toaster, he realized that he needed oil to make plastic. And oil is kind of a hard thing to get on your own, you know, to go drilling or something. So, so he cheated a bit. He went to a dumpster and he took some plastic stuff there, like old toys and stuff, and he melted it all down and made this kind of ugly-looking toaster. This is how hard it is if we're on our own, if we don't co-create value. A regular thing like a toaster. As you know, today we live in a world where a lot of the things surrounding us feels like they are kind of challenging. So we have, um, of course, technology. Technology, I will talk a bit about technology. But we also have a lot of things, a lot of mega trends that you heard about this morning, like the climate situation, like the migrant situation, like the economy, the, the financial system, a lot of these things that tells us something about the future. Because that's the topic right now. I know that we all share this same question, what's the future? <laughs> because we get kind of scared, we get kind of tensed when we hear about this. And we have to admit, we don't know. We don't know too much about the future for the very simple reason that this is the way, if we would make a, a, a chart, this is the way life looks like. We have been around for almost 200,000 years as a species. And life didn't change very much from generation to generation to generation until the last 200 years. So if that is time and this is change, everything sort of happened in the last second. And we are alive to be in this kind of movement right now. So it's even hard to see it's tilting this way. So therefore, we should learn by listening to the old science fiction writer, Douglas Adams. Do you remember Douglas Adams? He, he gave us the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Douglas told us, he said, there are some basic rules for us on how we react on technology. I think that this is not only the way we react to technology, this is the way we try to react and understand the future. So he said something like this, everything that is around when you are born is natural. That's just the way it is. So you don't think about it, you don't talk about it. You didn't think of the toaster this morning. You just you know, ate your breakfast and thought about other things. Everything they invent between the age of 15 and 35 is very exciting. Might be a new career, new technologies. We jump into it, we love it. However, everything they invent, everything that is presented after the age of 35, it's just unnormal. And this is kind of crucial because many uh, different ages, of course, in here, but many of us today, we believe very much in experience. 
but it might not be that we you know, save ourselves with experience. So for instance, if you think about how we behave, when I was uh, you know, small, I had my grandparents, they told me stories you know, that they woke up a regular day and then they went to work. And then when they came home from work, they had to clean up. They, they took a shower or something because you got dirty working. We don't do that anymore, do we? We outsource dirty work. So now we take a shower before we go to work. It would have sounded strange to them, you know. Why are you cleaning up? You're going to go to work, you know. Well, I want to look good at work. That's a strange and silly thought, you know. But that's the way we do it today. So. And the ones of you who have millennials back home, the Generation Y people, you know that it seems they don't shower or work. <laughs> and this is strange. You know, as I told you, we believe in experience. So I have a 20-year-old and a 16-year-old, so, so in situations like this, I tend to tell them how to behave. You know, go up, it's 10 o'clock, get yourself a shower, go to school, get good grades, get a good job. That's the way I did it. You have to, you know, copy. <laughs> Otherwise, the future will not be so good. Maybe I'm not the one who's right here. What if they are onto something? What if I should study the next generation to try to learn something about the future instead of being ignorant enough to try to make them behave like I did? So I think we should focus a little bit more on generation shifts. You know what they reply when you say something like that? YOLO. You only live once. <laughs> and of course they are right. You live once and that lifetime is longer and longer and longer. We live longer lives. But however, if we took you know, the lifespan of companies is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So when we talk about the business society, we don't have longer lives. The contrary. You can take uh, any corporation on the top list out there. These are some random logotypes from the S&P 500. If you study the S&P 500, you can see that between 1973 and 83, 35% of the companies on that list disappeared in a 10-year period. 83 to 93, it's 45%. 93 to 2003, it's 60%. And 2003 to 13, we came down to 70%. So right now, we live in a time on this planet where 700 out of the 1,000 biggest out there, they can't manage to stay on top on this list for more than maybe a decade. So you remember we used to say, when we talked about business society, we used to say that we have the three generations dilemma. Wealth never survives three generations, you heard of it. But today we should realize that, no, no, that's not the relevant thing here. The relevant thing is to focus on leadership. Leadership never survives a decade, it looks like. We will probably face 100%. So we are entering a time where no one will be around for more than maybe 10 years. Not in the top position, in the leadership position. So that tells us something, and that tells you something on an individual level about the future, it tells you that no matter what you do today, that will probably not be needed in 10 years' time. And that's not only bad, you know, because we do a lot of things that might not even be necessary to. So you hear about companies like this, you know, it's, it's hard to, to believe that these will not be around in 10 years' time. But you know, we have so many stories about disruptive change who put immense pressure on corporations, big global leaders, like Kodak. I don't need to tell you the story about Kodak, you heard it many times, I guess. But I want to tell you a side story that is kind of interesting when we want to learn and understand disruptive change. This here is Steve Sassoon. Steve was 24 years old in 1975 when he invented the world's first digital camera. Here it is, 3.6 kilograms of camera on his shoulder. You can see the, the cassette recorder here next to his ear. So. So what do you think Steve's boss said? Steve's boss probably told him everything about, you know, we need innovation, we need a lot of creativity, so, so challenge us, come on, what kind of ideas do you have? And Steve came up with this one, he said, so look what I came up with, we don't need any of our products anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's innovation. That's entrepreneurship. We can tear the old business model to pieces. Do you like that? Well, not always. <laughs> not if you're the world leader, like Kodak in 1975. They had 90% global market share, 145,000 employees. 
when we tell stories like this, we often forget the learnings. We tend to ridicule them and shake our heads and laugh. This was a very innovative company. This was, this was like the Google of the times. 90% global market share. They'd been to the moon. They'd been very innovative. A lot of things to be proud of, just like you. So, um, I don't think Steve said we don't need any of our products, but they had a meeting, and according to, to you know, the history here, that meeting didn't go too well for Steve, because he took the, the management team into this room, and he set up his camera, and he hooked it up to a big, fat television screen, and he took a photograph of his son. It, it looked like this. It had 0.01 megapixels. It took 23 seconds to record, 23 seconds to play it back. Do you think they were impressed? Of course not. This was Kodak. This was one of the leading brands of the world, you know. We associated the brand with quality, perfect pictures, perfect colors. What kind of crap is this? We've been to the moon, as I said. Besides, everybody knows it's a silly idea. Who will ever want to watch a picture on a screen? Kind of strange idea. You know, if you have a good Kodak moment, you frame it and you hang it on the wall, that's it. So, this meeting concluded, Steve, he understood, of course, but, but he said something like this in the end of the meeting. Yes, yes, I understand, but I want you to understand one thing. This technology will probably be good enough to compete with our film technology in just 15 years' time. And it's not so strange that a tech guy, you know, a technician, an engineer, tells you that technology will be important in the future. But it's kind of interesting that Steve said 15 years. And he was right almost to the month. It took them 14 years and nine months to create the world's first digital SLR camera, and quality in digital was good enough to compete with film. How did Steve know this was going to take 15 years? Well, he knew about something that we call Moore's Law. And you have heard about Moore's Law. So this guy, Gordon Moore, who founded the company Intel, you have stickers on your laptop that says Intel inside, that's the processing power. Gordon realized in 1965 that we are in exponential growth. Exponential growth means, of course, that we get double the processing power each time we measure. Double the power for the exact amount of, of, of money. And that meant that Gordon, he, he toured, he had you know, speaking gigs like this, and he told the audience that, I don't know how the future will be, but I know one thing. We are in exponential growth in processing power. That means that everybody will have access to advanced technologies. And when everybody has access to advanced technologies, everybody has superpowers. And when everybody has superpowers, the speed of change will be dramatic. It will increase. We can't even imagine. So this is the key takeaway. Remember this, change will never again be this slow. And we're still in the face of exponential tech growth. So, so if you think it's a bit stressy today, it's fast, you know. Enjoy this spring because it will never be this slow again. <laughs> That's you know, one thing we know about the future for sure. Okay, so to try to understand the complexity here, because you know, Darwin taught us 150 years ago, the survivor is the one with the ability to adapt to change. And the speed of change is increasing. Okay, so that's the, the conclusion here. But it's still, it's very hard. Imagine if you were a manager at Kodak in the 80s. Of course, you understand that digital technology will be very important. You maybe, you know, think that we will have a conference and we will talk about this, how to co-create value in this digital sphere. But it would have been hard to imagine, if you are the world leader with 90% global market share, and you have millions of cameras in sales all over the world, it would have been hard, if you have a brainstorming session, to play with the thought that maybe in just a couple of decades, we will not be able to sell millions of cameras, but billions. That's another chart. It would have been hard to think that, well, in just a couple of decades, People would take one trillion photographs each year. But that's it. That's the situation right now. We are not in a million market anymore. We're in a billion market. The, the global smartphone market this year is 1.5 billion units. And we take approximately one trillion pictures this year. If they would have thought, if they had a brainstorming session at Kodak about the future where people on this planet take one trillion pictures, then they would have obviously realized that that's not going to happen with film rolls. 
So to see, you know, things like this from the disruptive perspective is very challenging because not only do you have to be innovative, you also have to have the guts and be brave enough to challenge yourself and to beat your old business model. Maybe even be first, you know, early adopter, kill your own cash cow. And that's not easy done. So we believe the future looks like this. This is how we do it normally. I don't know if you ever tried budgeting or something, but usually then we take last year's result and we adjust everything by 5% or 13 or something, and we're happy. We can have a coffee break. But again, this is not the way the future will look like. The future, as a result of exponential technology, is hitting almost every industry right now. We heard about the Internet of Things. We heard about 3D printing. We heard about... Um, all sorts of uh, industrialization, 4.0, etc. These trends look like this. So it starts out on the minus side. It's very costly. It doesn't impress us. But then we have tremendous speed in growth here. So you can take one example, and you know, you're all familiar with how we sh do retail and shopping in society today. So we do a lot of shopping online. That started not long ago here in the 90s. And then, you know, everybody were excited and we, we went into, we bought a lot of IT stocks here in the beginning. Obviously, here in the beginning, none of the customers had changed behavior, so no one was shopping online because no one had a broadband connection. So then we had the bubble burst and it was a disaster and everybody was pissed, you know, because all the visionaries was wrong. At that time, when everything is on minus and we don't believe in any of this new technology, then there is only this little, little, little group of believers, optimists, and those are the geeks, the nerds. They, they see only the technology, so they're like, yeah, yeah, they will get it, they will get it. You know, they're just programming, programming, up all night drinking Coca-Cola or something. And then eventually we got it, because we got broadband connections and we even convinced our grandmother, you know, you, know, you don't need to worry, you can just type in the MasterCard details and online, it's no, you know, so now the online shopping chart is growing double digit. And the takeaway, because this happens always with us as human beings, we always make the same mistake. We never learn from history. We overestimate the amount of change in the short term span here. So we hear about a new technology, we think the world will change tomorrow, so we rush in to buy stocks or something, otherwise you will miss it all. And then we underestimate it, even though we see that people are actually changing behaviors. So right now, what do we do? Here we bought stocks, what do we do now? Uh, building shopping malls like crazy. <laughs> you know, they will always go to a shopping mall, obviously. So, <laughs> The thing to say is nothing wrong with the blue line. The blue line is everything up until the red line crosses it. But when the red line crosses the blue line, when someone comes up with a much better way to solve the problem, much more efficient, then the blue line goes like this. The Volkswagen turn, we call it this year. <laughs> this here is the Kodak turn. This here is the Nokia turn, for the ones of you from Finland. This here is the Detroit turn. We have so many examples of this. I usually refer to this as the life of a Christmas pig. For, you know, if you're from, from the Nordic countries, you know we eat Christmas pigs. So you know that. And, and for the life of the Christmas pig, it all looks perfect up until December, and then something very unexpected <laughs> happens. You know, so. Uh, we will see so many Christmas pigs in the business life and business society in the future. Not because managers, employees, suppliers, stakeholders are bad. Because you are good. That's the reason why we will see Christmas pigs. Because you are good, just like Kodak. You are so good performing, growing in the blue line, so you don't look for red lines to destroy that blue line. Someone else does. With an extraordinary speed today. That's what we call disruption, and that's why we today, and no matter what kind of industry you go to, we talk a lot about disruptive change. This is like a natural law. An idea is very good, but money beats idea. If someone has a lot of money, they don't like your idea, they just buy it and bury it, or they own it, it's theirs. However, the ones with money, they need to put some of that money in the pockets of politicians. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's not the way we do it here. It's like, I mean, we have more ethical, so we're a little, you know, not so corrupt. So, so here we would like, uh, hire a lobbyist who could uh, promise them 2,000 jobs or, or call a lawyer in Panama or something. So a little more you know, ethical. <laughs> if you don't put some of the money in the pockets of politicians, however, those politicians might come up with legislation that you don't like. They build walls and make you know, trade barriers and stuff like that. So that's, you know... Something you have to watch out for, of course. However, it doesn't matter how much political power you have today. Because that power is limited 
to a city or a country, a place on this planet, and technology is borderless. And we see this over and over and over again. Not only is technology exponential and borderless, but more interestingly, it's everywhere. Today, everyone has access. So no matter where you go and travel, you will meet processing power today. And if we think about processing power as brain power, we have more brain power everywhere. So the penetration of processing power today in many rural areas is greater than the penetration of water toilets, and you know this. And this, of course, means that change will happen very fast. Because when I was growing up in the 70s, this is the way a computer looked like. It's very easy when you see this image to, to remember. That's why not many people had a computer. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of not very accessible. Very expensive, probably. Very complicated stuff here. So. But this was not the most interesting thing, that we got processing power, more brain power. The most interesting thing was when this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, in 1990, came up with the idea of hyperlinks. He called it the World Wide Web. Do you remember the day in 1990? Of course not. This was like Christmas Eve for seven nerds. <laughs> no one understood the concept of the World Wide Web. We were busy talking about Rain Man, who won the Academy Award for Best Picture or something, or the Alaska oil spill that year. But what this meant, this is the world's first web page, if you ever visited it in CERN. So what this meant was actually, not only do we have processing power as in a computer, a computer that can process stuff, just like my brain can process stuff, but it is connected so I can co-create value by connecting it to all the other brains out there. And with that global, borderless collaboration, the World Wide Web was born. And you know what happened after that. <laughs> The speed increased tremendously as a result by this co-creating value. And we started to talk about digitalization. So can we actually create value? So instead of building toasters and stuff like the physical goods, you know, that is very expensive, it takes a lot of labor, and it's expensive, especially if you want to trade over borders. It was hard to, to do business over borders. In a digital world, it's very easy to do business over borders. So we started to talk about digitalization. And here you can see on the picture to the left, you have 13 different industries that are gone. Because we don't need them that way. We came up with red lines on how to solve the problem in a much easier way. So therefore, we, we went from hardware to software, from products to services. And this just started, of course. We, you know, we had these smartphones not even 10 years. Talk about the red line, you know. The life we are living today in society is totally different than the lives our parents lived. And of course, the lives our children will live will be totally different from the lives we live today. And that's kind of amazing when you think about it didn't used to be like that. So when you, when you come up with an idea on how to digitalize something, then obviously you don't need products anymore, like in Adam's stuff. That means the margin cost goes to zero. So for instance, if you, you watch movies, you don't need to collect movies like this anymore. I, I guess you don't have a media cabinet back home. Maybe you, your children definitely don't have a media cabinet back home. Because this is not the way you solve the problem anymore. You don't have to get dressed and go downtown to rent a movie when you want to watch a movie. You can just go to, to Netflix. This is another of the Christmas pig uh, graphs, you know. Do you, you remember Blockbuster if you went to the US or UK? They were the world leading, the world leader in movies. Here, 2004, six billion dollars in revenue renting and selling movies. And then this guy, uh, Reed Hastings came up with the idea of maybe we can do this thing digitally instead. And he went actually to Blockbuster in Austin, Texas to ask them, do you want to you know, buy this idea? Because Netflix could be the digital brand and you are the retail brand because you're great in retail. Uh, and as you can see, they turned him down. You know. <laughs> they weren't so interested in digital. So six years later, that world-leading business was bankrupt. Not because they were bad, because they were the best at doing something that no one needs anymore. That's kind of interesting. So, dematerialization, demonetization, but more interestingly, digitalization means decentralization. So, 15 years ago, we got Wikipedia. Wikipedia was a very strange idea in the beginning. So you're telling me that ordinary people 
are going to write encyclopedias. Silly idea. Do you understand how much errors and wrongs it will be in that encyclopedia? And it turned out, no, no, the opposite. Ordinary people do not only like to, to create value and contribute with content. Ordinary people like to create value by right wrongs and going for errors as well. So this is the most correct encyclopedia we have today. So we learned that collaboration can be in a decentralized manner. No matter how smart you are in this room today, there is always someone smarter on the outside of the room. And that is key today to a lot of successful projects and collaborations and value creations that you actually open up and go for transparency. You can even go for crowdfunding if you want funding for a project. In December, Google and NASA told us that they got the world's first quantum computer live and kicking. And what is a quantum computer? Well, that would take way too long to talk about. But let's just focus on the headline here. It is about 100 million times faster than the ones we have today. Sounds like a pretty fast computer, doesn't it? <coughs> so we are entering the, e the era of quantum computing right now. This is it. There is one in Silicon Valley at NASA. So remember what I told you, your kids growing up in this world right now, they will not talk about this. They will not think it's amazing. They will just think that's the way it's always been, because that's the way it was when they were born, you know. So when they go to a conference in 10 years and you talk about uh, NX 20 years journey here, they will probably have a speaker or someone in a hologram dress or something, and they will show them, you know, back in 2016, there was only one quantum computer. It was this room. And they will see this, you know. It was a whole fucking room and one computer, and there was only one in the whole world. <laughs> because obviously in 10 years, everybody will have quantum computing power, probably, on their eyes or in a chip in the brain or something. Right now, we are starting to make computers be nice as well. This is Sophia by Hanson Robotics. Sophia, the project Sophia, is all about understanding our facial expressions and then um, just, you know, doing the same. Because we like to talk to someone. If I cry, you cry. If I laugh, you laugh. Then, then we start to, you know, bond in a serious way. And as you know, computing programs today are very intelligent. You have heard about IBM's Watson, for instance. It's been six years since IBM's computer program, Watson, beaten the world champions in Jeopardy. So these two guys here, they are the best ever from the human species, you know. These are the ones who were best in the game Jeopardy. And then they just tried it. So what if we could, you know, put an algorithm up against these masters, these champions? And they gave the computer 20 minutes to study the game of Jeopardy. And it was like, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it, you know. And then it, it had some more, like a couple of hours to go online and collect all the information you want, like 200 terabytes or something. And then they disconnected the computer, because it would have been cheating if the computer was online. And then they started the game. And they had to uh, uh, stop and pause the game, because when they started the game, um, they, they found out that the computer, one of the things it downloaded was the Urban Dictionary. So his, his first reply was like, that's a bullshit question. <laughs> so it learned, you know, to, to speak the way we do. So they had to erase the Urban Dictionary. And then. Just two weeks ago, there are many, many interesting projects with the Watson product today, so go, go check it out if you're into artificial intelligence. Two weeks ago, we got news from Georgia Tech University in Georgia, USA, that one of the professors at Georgia Tech, he applied for using the Watson technology as an assistant teacher, and then he, you know, let the students to, to send all their emails, all the requests for help when they were studying at home to their assisting teacher, Jill Watson. And they've been doing it for a whole semester. None of the students had realized that there is not a Jill Watson. It's actually an algorithm I'm talking to. So the point here I'm trying to make is one of the red lines we are approaching very fast right now is the red line of artificial intelligence. Are we actually going to be able to create machines that are not only doing what I tell them to do as a programmer, but these machines, these systems, these algorithms, these computers, they can learn by themselves, just like a child or a dog. And what does that make me? Because I don't know what's going on inside of the brain of my child. I just you know, try to figure it out and try to be supportive. And then they're on their own. So it looks like this. First, we create a machine smart like a mouse. It's, it's expensive, not very impressive. Is that all it can do? You know, it's, it doesn't seem very intelligent. No, no, but it did it on, on its own. You know. 
brain goes bigger, just like human evolution, like a chimp, eventually we will create the machine smart like a human being. Maybe someone that we think should be behind bars or something because this is a lunatic, but then... And then, as you know, the, the, the line here between a lunatic and a genius is not very big, even though we like to think so. <laughs> you know it, you feel it every morning, I know, I know. So, when we create this crazy machine, it's just going to be a matter of weeks or months before we create Einstein. And this is when it starts to get interesting when you think about this red line. There is nothing that tells us that technology will stop at the Einstein level just because we did. So we came up with the concept here of, okay, so Einstein is the most intelligent human being ever alive. Technology will probably go for double Einstein, then double, double Einstein, then just go on. And then it's very relevant to start to ask yourself, what's the future? Because it might very well be that in just one or two decades, technology will solve so many of today's problems that we think are complicated. So maybe when we look back on this era, in just 10, 20 years, we realized that we were very primitive. We had problems like cancer and climate change. It took a couple of seconds. That was it. Maybe. We will see. So in a case like this, what would the blue line be? What's the blue line here? Well, it's knowledge. If we have unlimited, abundant intelligence, then it's not true. Then you don't need to go to school. Yeah, you can do it. Get a good education because it's very fun. It's for your self-actualization. But there is no one out there who's willing to pay for knowledge anymore. Just like we outsource blue-collar work, we can outsource white-collar work to, to machines. Maybe. So we have to be humble about these things instead of convinced that you have to do like I did because otherwise, you know, the future will be very hard. And we have to realize that we don't know. Just by looking at the speed, we definitely don't know. And this is not something that might happen eventually. We have applications and machines out there. This is a Tesla car. If anyone know, owns a Tesla car, you know that in November last year, you got the autopilot. So Tesla launched the autopilot. So to sell a car today is not about selling hardware anymore. It's about providing the customer with hardware and then update it with new software. You can see, obviously, this is the first test drive in the New York City traffic. So this guy is not trusting in technology for 100%. He's a bit, you know, scared here. But you know, this it goes fast, you know. <laughs> this was November. It's been about six months. During these six months, Tesla claimed to have uh, recorded 47 million miles of driving around this world. So this is how machine learning looks like. They don't build, build, build in the factory and then try to sell it by marketing. They just sell it and then constantly let the machines and the customers do all the testing and upgrading. And then you get a new operating system every now and then in the car, when the car learns some new things, you know. And it's very interesting, because transportation is one of the key things that we need to solve in a much more efficient way. We heard about one of the big megatrends is urbanization. So we all live in big cities today. And that's the big trend, it's continuing. If you go to sub-Saharan Africa or Asia, urbanization, that's the megatrend. And it's a problem. Because when we need to go out and do things in this real world, you know. We need transportation for people and goods. And we don't do transportation very efficiently. We have cars. We use our cars on average one hour each 24. That means we just park them for 23 hours. It's not so very efficient. So that's why all these tech companies are in, in transportation. I don't think Google, this is a Google car, I don't think Google wants to start to sell cars. I think that they just want to go into the area of data. Because data, when people move around in these urbanized areas, is going to be the next valuable thing when we don't move around in the internet, you know. So we move around in the cyberspace or we move around in the city. That's the two data points here. This is a Google car. It doesn't even have a steering wheel, so you cannot even try to drive it if you wanted to. They, they told me when I visited in Silicon Valley, they told me we have rear view mirrors because that's, you know, we are uh, according to have it uh, uh, to the law. But the law doesn't say anything about a steering wheel, so... And this is very interesting, because when we think about concepts like this, okay, so today in society, we buy cars, that's hardware, 
But then, as you know, the ones the who don't shower and work, they start to share cars instead of buy cars. That car sharing is a big growing trend in megacities. And next we can you know, just assume that we start to share self-driving cars, like this. Technology is working perfectly. The big, big obstacle right now is, is the law. Because you, know, you are all going to say, I didn't drive, and that's a big new problem. You know? So when we start to share self-driving cars, then none of the cars need to park anymore. They can just roam around and hunt for passengers all day long. And then you can just go to the transportation cloud, just like you go to uh, you know, the hard disk cloud. And you can require some transportation. I'm alone, I'm going to the airport, or we're a bunch of five, we're going to go partying, we need a big red you know, convertible or something. And you have different kind of car services in the transportation cloud. So then we could move from buying car as a product to buy car as a service. And this is just an example. You understand that there will be tremendous change when we start to convert everything to services instead of products, instead of ownership. And this is good. It's very hard for the old industry. I mean, the Volkswagen turn will not pick up pace again if people stop to buy cars and start to buy services instead. So that's a new interesting trend. And right now we're talking about the auto industry. It's 6% of the European workforce. Big changes. But we need to focus on how to solve the old problems more efficient. And this is one example on how to co-create more value instead of everybody owning a car. New way of thinking. And we need to do it. The ones of you who are from Beijing know desperately we need to do it because you already had the red alert twice in December. So this is not a problem that will face us in the future. The problem of uh, environmental issues and climate change is very much present today. And you know, this is the way it looks like. This is the overshoot today curve. So blue line up until 1986, all the people on this planet consumed uh, the amount of resources during one year that one planet can supply us. But if for three decades now, all the way since 1986, we actually consumed more resources than this planet can give us. And that, of course, is a very easy problem to understand, that that's not sustainable. So the key task for us, if we want a better future to co-create value, is to co-create more value with less resources. That, therefore, we have to be brave enough to challenge the old blue lines and come up with new red ones. Otherwise, you know, this is not a beautiful and optimistic future up here. But we have a problem, of course. We, we have the financial system not working very well. We came up with this system years ago just to keep control. And as you know, if you live in Europe, you know that we lost control quite long ago. We talk about the financial crisis in 2008, but it actually never went north again. So for 10 years straight now, we had a financial crisis here. Economy, constant need of stimulus. So, and just to solve this crisis, it seems like the cure is always making the crisis worse, because the central bankers actually lower the interest rate to zero. In Sweden here, we have negative interest rates, so it's impossible to get rid of money. Did you try it? You know, they say, no, no, you have to take care of the money, it's your problem, you know, I don't want any money. <laughs> and that's a new situation, very disruptive change, and it tells us something about the future. It tells us that this will just not go away. No matter what we think and do, we will face a lot of new situations as a result of a dysfunctional financial system in the future, because we are creating massive debt bubbles right now. And if you look at the companies again, the ones I said where 70% are disappearing in a 10-year period, we can see that what did they do during these 20 years from a financial perspective? Well, they borrowed money because money was almost for free, you know, at a zero interest rate. And then they bought back their own stocks, and then they increased dividends. So it's actually, instead of being innovative, they just tell us something that we don't have any ideas. It's better the shareholders take back all the money, you know. That's the way they treat us. So it tells us something. This will not be the future world. When we meet in just 10 years' time, we will talk about totally new brands and companies, probably not even born today. So that means that we are in the beginning of the beginning of something, and we will have new competitors in all kinds of businesses, and we never heard about them so far. And that's kind of exciting because it means that there is a lot of opportunity out there. If the value goes down, we have a problem, though. Because here in Europe, we turn to Asia. When we didn't have growth in Europe, we turn to Asia. So this is the Shanghai Stock Exchange. And as you know, this winter here, 
the, the Shanghai Stock Exchange turned, turned the wrong way too, so we were kind of scared and disappointed. We started talking actually about the stock market crash in China. It's interesting. I downloaded this and you can see that this is two years ago in May 2014. So if you put some money into the Shanghai Stock Exchange two years ago, you would have been 40% up today, 4-0. That's a stock crash. Why do we call it that in the media, in our thoughts? Well, because we believed in that. We always believe in peak. Just like the Norwegian companies, you know, they believe in an oil price above $100 a barrel. That's why they're closing everything down in Stavanger today. So the problem is, even if it's an S&P company, or if it's the Shanghai Stock Exchange, or if it's an oil price, no matter what kind of asset we are talking about, if the asset loses value, so the asset is not worth as much anymore, then the only thing we are left with is debt. Because the debt doesn't go away. And that's a new problem. Because the young generation, the ones who don't shower and work, they say that this is a one-way street. I'm not going to go educate myself, try to get a good job, because the system is wrong. We hear that more often all the time. They even talk about it when they meet in Davos. Inequality is a big mega trend. And then you see the result of inequality. It's very obvious what, what you know, we see in politics right now. You, people tend to vote for all different kind of hairstyles. And so the biggest trend, I believe, during our lifetime, in this generation shift, where we look and, dip and, and you know, compare us to our kids, will be in trust. Who do you trust? Because if you are about to co-create value, to collaborate, to do business with other people, then you are totally dependent on trust. Trust is the foundation for any business. And we can assume that they will trust in totally different brands, organization, leader, etc. Because there is not a lot of trust in the old leaders out there anymore. As I said, we see it obviously in, in politics today. One thing, however, they do trust in networking. Because they grew up with networking. So the next generation will use the networking effect to determine who to do business with. I don't care what you say about yourself. I don't care what this says on your business card. I don't care what you're advertising, if you manage to get your message out there. I care about what others say about you. That's a new strategy. What does the network have to say about you? How much value do you actually create for the network? And that's a new paradigm, I think. We already saw it in something that we call the sharing economy. The sharing economy, it's kind of funny because sharing is nothing new, definitely. You know, during these 200,000 years, we always shared. We always collaborated. That's why we are here today. We're the only species on this planet who can collaborate on an intelligent level the way we are. But we shared with a few, the ones we trusted. And now, in this world, we can share with many. Because we can determine by the network effect who to trust and who to not trust. So if you travel, for instance, if, if you want to stay here in Malmö for a couple of days, you can go and you can rent Eva's apartment on Airbnb. And you don't know Eva, and Eva don't know you. So this didn't take place before the internet. Then you could only stay in Malmö if you had a cousin or something, a relative, you know. Otherwise, you had to stay in a hotel. So you click on Eva's profile and you can see up here that, oh wow, Eva is the super host. This means that many people, hundreds of people from all over the world gave Eva a big appreciation and applause, you know, because that, this is a great host. So you feel that you're pretty confident that this is going to be a smooth transaction, and Eva will click your profile to see if you will smoke in the bathroom or behave bad and put all the towels on the floor and make a mess, or, or if you're a good person. So we can determine who to trust and who to not. And this is a, a very exciting trend, I think. You can find much on, on the sharing economy topic today. If you want to meet new people when you travel, you, for instance, you can go to eatwith.com. So this is, uh, I took an example, this is in Italy. So if you want to get, eat good Italian food when in Rome, you might not want to end up in Piazza Navona at one of the restaurants, you know, tourist trap. You can go to a home, to a family like this. It will cost you 59 euros in this case, and they have a five-star rating. And you can eat at home. And this is a revolution, because then we use technology to get back to social interaction and collaboration again. Very few were brave enough to just walk out in the, in the night in Rome and knock on the door, you know, Buonasera, can I eat here tonight? That's not the way we did it. We were stuck in a tourist trap instead. If you want to find a good carpenter, maybe assemble some IKEA furniture, you can go to Task Runner. You can find people who can learn you speak Spanish or play the guitar or whatever and go by ratings. 
If they are really good, they have the brand called Super Rabbits. And they are really trusted ones. If you need colleagues, you need people, because you're working on a tough task and you want challenges and creativity, you don't have maybe a boss or an office, you can go to home office, office. So you work at people's places, build collaboration and co-create value that way. These are the things, the trends we see in the new generation. You, know? you can even find a toilet if you need to go you know, do one or two when you're out in the city here. You can find a toilet on Airbnb. <laughs> Someone is willing to share their toilet with you. So uh, this didn't take off here in Scandinavia as of yet, but uh, the closest one to us right now I managed to find is Peter. Peter, uh, north of Copenhagen here. He has a first floor bathroom just by the entrance. It's super easy and comfortable to use. If you're lucky, I can make you super awesome coffee to go as well. And he will charge you five US dollars if you want to use his toilet, you know. <laughs> These are examples. This is a new economic paradigm. We have a lot of resources in this society and we don't use them very efficiently. We have cars, we have toilets, we have, we know, we have everything. And with this digital technology and networking effect, we can actually increase the efficiency in how we use everything in a way we never even imagined before. I think this just started. And then, as you know, if we take the red and blue line again and we think about the concept like Airbnb, everybody heard about Airbnb, so that's an easy compact, uh, concept to talk about today. We can see that it started here eight years ago in 2008. So 2008, a couple of students in San Francisco, they could not afford rent. So they came up with the concept of putting air mattresses on the floor in the living room in the apartment. They did, they did a web page called airbedandbreakfast.com. And then eventually they had a couple of guests and they got some extra income. And that's eight years ago. Do you think Blue Line, do you think um, Hilton Corporation, they got scared when they heard about this? Did you hear it? So the Luft mattress on the floor. In <laughs> of course not. It has nothing to do with their business. Everybody knows if you're going to be good in the hotel industry, you need to have good properties, big houses, you need to have uh, great staff, awesome CRM system, stuff like that. Air mattresses on the floor it has nothing to do with it, has it? Eight years ago, and now this year, Airbnb have housing in 192 countries. We are going to rent 80 million, 80 million guest nights on this platform this year. And the value is greater than the value of Hilton Corporation, if you ask the venture capitalists. They don't have any houses, no staff, no CRM system, nothing. They have one thing, an application, where we can find people, wherever we go in the world, who to trust and who do not. That's a huge challenge to the old industry, of course. And as I said, this is not about Airbnb. This is about the sharing economy. The sharing economy is about the concept of sharing assets. Because if we share assets in a more efficient way, we can co-create value in a more efficient way, and we can out-compete the others. So if you have a chainsaw, you have a sailing boat, and I have a house in the mountains, we can share. And if we can share because we trust each other, well, maybe then we don't need to do like mom and dad this. We, maybe we don't even need an education or cut our hairstyle or you know, go for a big fancy job or go to the bank to have debt or anything, because we can share. That's a new paradigm, a new opportunity. And you know what's up next? This is Google. Google have, uh, for many years now, been experimenting with uh, weather balloons. So this is the Google Loon project. And they are sending weather balloons to 20,000 meters to send down the internet to the ground beneath, you know. Facebook is doing the same. They have uh, the Facebook Aquila project, a solar-driven airplane. This is the wingspan of a Boeing 747. It weighs as much as a Toyota Prius. This one is going to stay up for three months by solar power and then beam down internet via laser to hit, you know, like a receiver this big, like a coin. And the object here, the goal, of course, is to let these ones, the ones who already have processing power, also have connectivity. Because today, in 2016, almost two-thirds of the global population is still not online. Two-thirds. Think about that. Think about where that will take us in the future when everyone in Uganda, in India, in Kenya, in Tanzania, everywhere will have connectivity. 
you know, what happened here, you know. So they can, just like they leapfrogged copper wires and went straight into mobile phone, they can leapfrog infrastructure, they can skip schools and everything, because they can find everything they want to know online. They can go to an online university like Coursera, and if they want to get an MBA, they can get an MBA. They can listen to, you know, lectures in Stanford, Harvard, Berkeley, and have 300,000 classmates instead of 30, all over the world, in an alumni network. And then they can call you at Enix and say, hey, I'm in Tanzania, uh, I heard your IT manager told you it was going to take 12 months and cost $2 million to do that. You know, we can do it here in Tanzania, two weeks, 17 bucks. <laughs> and you will say, what? Is that even possible? Is that legal? And they will say, yeah, yeah, check our webpage. We have all the references. We did this for Coca-Cola and this for Boeing. <laughs> and you will say, oh, that's pretty amazing. So, so can you work as a consultant? And they will say, yeah, sure, we charge you $1 an hour. One dollar an hour, and you will say one dollar. Well, well, that's a problem because it will cost me thirty dollars to send one dollar to Tanzania, you know. And they will say, yeah, that's just because you have that old central banking system. They are fooling you, you know. They think that you actually believe it take four days to to wire money to Tanzania, <laughs> like an email would take four days. Skip that, you know. This is the way money looks like in your part of the world. You you never have any cash anymore, do you? This is money. So money is all about debt as well. We, we don't check for how much money we have when we go to our online bank. We check how much the bank owes us. And we believe that they have it, even though we know that they don't. You know? So <laughs> that's another topic. But, so skip this one here. And let's go to the App Store and download the Bitcoin wallet instead. You heard about it. So with this, we don't need any central authority. Actually, I'm only 13. I don't have a banking account, you know. So we can start trade cross borders immediately. I will get the money right away. We can trade in microtransaction, like one pence at a time. What do you say? You good to go for it? And you will say, I'm not sure. Do I get airline bonus points on this one? <laughs> because that's the way we want it. But I am pretty sure that they will be interested. The, the five billion people on this planet today who don't even have a banking account, I'm pretty sure that they will be interested in disrupting everything that they didn't take part of before. And this is happening right now, when we get the Internet of Money. Just like we got the Internet of Information 10, 20 years ago, I'm sorry. So my message to you is that this is the world we are living in today. This is an image, you have probably seen it. This is a visualization of how the Internet connects us. And this tells you how the co-creation of value will look like in the future. It's a totally different system than before, because up until now, for 200,000 years, we did everything in hierarchy. Few on top, many on bottom. That's the way we organized everything. Nothing wrong with that. We are here today, we're very happy because a lot of great innovation and evolution. But this is the way we can organize collaboration and co-create value today. In a network, totally independent, peer-to-peer, no top to reach. And if you think about that, it's kind of mind-blowing. Then you realize that when we think about the future, we should be, as I said, very humble, because there is very little, I guess, that we know today. We are entering a world where the, the reality, as we call it, will probably not even be always in this physical world. I'm not going to ask for a hand take here, because uh, almost uh, only um, the pornography business is into virtual reality as of now. But if you tried virtual reality, then you know that the, the experience you have here is very powerful, and this is happening right now. So I think that, you know, the future is something we never experienced before. And we are in the beginning of the beginning. We will start right now, we will start to have a genetics revolution that will reprogram our bodies. We will have a nano-revolution so we can start to build atoms on a molecular scale. Everything that is ahead of us. So the message to you is just to realize that it will be about co-creation, but the scale and the speed will be something we never experienced before. And if there is only one thing you remember from this session, remember what Gordon Moore said already in 1965, change will never again be this slow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Do we have any questions, Stefan? I'm probably not going to be able to answer any, but we can talk. <laughs>
I've been sitting and thinking a lot about questions and what to ask, and the one that has been coming up all the time is what's next, what's next, what's next? But I guess that's the question that you cannot answer. Or I, I believe, I sincerely believe that that's the question you shouldn't ask yourself, because then you will get stressed. And a lot of people are suffering from that today. It's hard in this, in this life, we see that. If we look, uh, for instance, on the prognosis from the World Health Organization, they say that in 2030, the biggest health problem, global, will be a mental disorder. Because we, we don't like the speed as much as we, you know, so we don't enjoy this, we feel stressed by it. So, so that's going to be one big thing. The companies who can help others to feel better, to feel more secure, would be tremendously successful, of course. So I guess that also brings us into experience as getting more and more important in all business relationships than what we had in the past, meaning it's not so much a hardware as an experience that the market is after. I, I truly believe that, as you said, that the relation is growing to be the most important thing, because in, in a fierce competition, then, uh, and especially if everything is transparent and people can talk, like now, then it's not going to be about price and quality anymore. Price and quality is going to be hygiene in every, you know, every industry. So then we're back to, to doing business with the people we actually prefer to do business with, the ones we trust and like. If we look on the examples we're showing, uh, seeing in your great show, uh, we saw a lot of I would say consumer-oriented interactions or businesses that are changing, that are going to the end customer. How do you see the trends in the business-to-business -business environment? Is I, there a difference compared to the... No, business? I don't think so. I think that's one of my key takeaways. I think it's people-to-people. -people. And I think that uh, the creation of business-to-consumers or business-to-business -business is a, a theoretical you know, that, that's something that we like to believe because that's the way we did. So, so when we go and, go and do business, then we put on a suit and a tie and we behave differently. But in this generation, as I said, it's not going to be about what you say. It's going to be about what the network says anyway. So there is only going to be people to people. That's peer to peer, you know. So I don't think there is a, a, a big thing to win if you focus on being differently when you do business with businesses. Than, than, because in the end, it's going to be people to people. Anyone who has a question? I have a couple of more, but I would happily share the... I will go for one more. It's like, uh, yeah, we have one over here. W wait, you will get to the microphone here. Should be on. I say it that way. So you were talking about Please artificial no. intelligence. So what, which risks do you see there? Because it's not just a good thing, I think, that are there. So, and how do you think that uh, we should tackle the risk that is in there? The, May I just repeat the, the, the question? The question is before. the risk of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, what, what risks do we see? Well, first of all, we have a lot of um, scientists like Stephen Hawkins or Bill Gates. Uh, you, you probably read a lot about these headlines you now, warning us about this. Because according to many people who, who actually know more than probably we know about these tasks, they say that if we can create such a thing as a machine learning concept, that would by far be the, the greatest creation of humanity ever. We cannot even imagine. So maybe we should compare it to the atomic bomb. However, you know, it doesn't matter in the end what kind of risks it poses because we, history taught us, we will try it anyway. So we did the atomic bomb. So there is this joke, you know, that um, what will be the last words uttered by humanity? It might probably be like, what does this button do? <laughs> You know, we will try it. Someone will try it. So therefore, just like you say, it, it's more interesting to start to talk about, okay, how should we try to create these systems to co-create value so that everyone gets something? Because we know today that, in theory, if we in the future have machines that do everything, food, energy, water, anything, you know, then we have an abundance of all the things Maslow told, told us about was necessary. So then the problem is not going to be about competition anymore. We don't need, maybe in a future like that, to compete. But we need to be able to share. Because if we don't share, we will fight. And that is sort of a new thing to us, because we never shared very, you know, we, we never very successful in sharing. So, so we have a new thing, probably, to figure out there. I, didn't, I don't know if that was answering enough. But, but I, I think also, I think we always focus on risks in new technologies. Uh, forgetting the risks in the old technologies and the old behaviors. So when I talk about things like cryptocurrency, people are like, hey, isn't that Bitcoin thing only for criminals? And I'm like, well, if you're going to you know, talk about risks in a currency and criminals, then you have to make the US dollar illegal. <laughs> so. 
you will have more chances to interact with Stefan during today sure. here as well. I'll be around for the break and everything. Exactly. And we will also have a panel discussion later on today where we hope to see you on stage as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.